<laughs> Amen. May the words that are heard be thine and not mine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. From our New Testament reading, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I still don't know what I was waiting for, and my time was running wild. A million dead-end streets, and every time I thought I'd got it made, it seemed the taste was not so sweet. So I turned myself to face me, but I've never caught a glimpse of how the others must see the faker. I'm much too fast to take that test. You recognize it, don't you? Changes. Turn and face the strange. Changes. Don't want to be a richer man. Changes. Turn and face the, the strange. Changes. Just going to have to be a different man. Time may change me, but I can't change time. You may have recognized the lyrics from the late David Bowie's 70s hit, Changes. They suggest a realization one discovers, usually later in life, that the superficial framework, before deemed so critical, is actually less significant, less important than a deeper pursuit, a quest for the more essential need in life. It requires changes, changes of focus and intent on many different and emotional and spiritual levels, changes, and most aren't real fond of those. This morning's lections dive immediately into the Hebrew law that we have been discussing for the past few weeks. Our Old Testament reading is the giving of the Ten Commandments by God to Moses. Do you remember History of the World Part 1 with Mel Brooks? I almost always think of this when I read the Ten Commandments. It's ruined it for me in a lot of ways. So he's coming down the mountain with the three tablets, right? And he missteps, because you know that would be classic Mel Brooks. And he drops one of the tablets. He says, I give you the 15, Ooh, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> anyway, these ten basic rules are the foundation from which Torah was constructed and the premise for the first five books of Hebrew Scripture, the Pentateuch. From this collection comes the basis of what it means to be Hebrew or Jewish. Israel was committed to the following of this standard, at least as a moralism. But God became fatigued by their fundamentalism and even manipulation of the law. It became a matter of going through the motions or just conveniences when God had more esoteric intention. Remember, God desired relationship with creation creator creating mankind not out of need or requirement but out of a desire for a developing cultivatable relationship this is Paul's impetus in our reading in 1 Corinthians this morning can't you just hear it maybe a little backstory on the Corinthians would help the Corinthians were a screwed up bunch the church in Corinth was unlike many of the others founded by Paul. Its consistency was a broad band, socio-economic, educational representation of the community, from the very rich and societally aligned to the extremely marginalized. They were influenced by Greek philosophy and Hebrew tradition. 
Some displayed what Paul perceived to be a hubris or a sense of arrival at some sort of moral, spiritual, higher ground. They thought their witness, their witness, was that they were such a model of spiritual elitism. Ugh. Paul employs the metaphor of body to achieve unity and oneness with them, but they were all across the board on several living together in community issues. To make matters worse, another missionary type from the church in Jerusalem, Apollos, had visited after Paul left and stirred the whole group into a frenzy about adherence to the Jewish law, basically. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, right? So you had to conform to Jewish right to be legitimate. Furthermore, it was inferred that Paul had conveniently omitted that from his message because he was afraid of or trying to avoid the controversy. It was a mess, a real mess. People were taking sides, and they were drawing lines right along those previously described social boundaries. Yeesh. Sounds a lot like the bickering in today's church over administrative and functionality points of issue. They were seeing a lot of trees, but they were missing the forest. Paul suggests that all of the structure and tradition and liturgy and doctrine and policies and the way we've always done it, Father Chris, they're not the main thing. The Corinthians needed to change their hearts. Paul describes this ideal as foolishness to those who are perishing. Now, perishing isn't intended in a physical sense, but more of a spiritual stagnating or decaying, as is the case with any organism or culture or structure that reaches a certain stage only to cease progressing. The great farce in Americanism is that we are led to believe that we can plateau at some comfortable level with the intent of maintaining that indefinitely. It simply is not the case. When we stop searching, when we stop seeking, or think that we have arrived, we are most likely digressing. My dad always used to say, if you're waiting on me, you're backing up. The Corinthians were backing up. They were caught up in the minutia of being church, not becoming the body. Diane Butler Bass refers to it as a great awakening. Christian Wyman calls it his bright abyss, while Richard Rohr prefers the analogy of falling upward. All of us must, must reach a point only after we have established the container of our lives the container being this structure that consists of our social, professional, family, religious, financial, all of those frameworks, after which we come to understand a need for a greater sustenance. That's what fills the vessel. All the other is necessary, critical. I mean, it's why you have life insurance, right? But it only constructs the, con the, the container. It's like the caterpillar's cocoon. The deep becoming need still to occur. It's what was intended from the beginning. God creating mankind. It's the eighth day of creation. Becoming within. Now, Paul isn't throwing out the rules. I mean, Torah was necessary. Can you imagine a society where you could just murder and lie and cheat? No way. 
basic reason or being created in God's image, Imago Dei, that tells us that. Furthermore, it's not like it's exclusive to Judaism or Christianity to have some sort of ethical code. All cultures share this basic understanding. Even more so, you can find ethical codes with Menza or the Boy Scouts or Rotary. Statutes are part of the container. Faith is something else. Did you notice how ticked off Jesus was today in the temple? Yes, he was mad about turning the narthex into Walmart. But to a greater sense, he was frustrated at the shallow application of their faith. It was drive-through religion, guised as good organization that allowed for efficient sacramental execution and obligatory opportunity to consider the poor while you're at it. Wow, this is efficient church. It's prudent. But it lacked faith. Soren Kierkegaard, in Fear and Trembling, defines faith as believing in the absurd. Faith is believing in the absurd. Paul calls it foolishness. Richard Rohr adds, faith is simply to trust the real and to trust that God is found within it. Unfortunately, most will never reach this point of becoming. The pursuit of the common and what we deem more important, that becomes all we ever will be. In many cases, it requires intense loss just to turn our thinking. We rise in our successes, necessarily so, just to be torn from or cause to question our previously determined securities. We have to change. Lent allows us opportunity to consider more. Christ's passion is our model. As he was becoming himself, turning his face to Jerusalem with obedience to his call and what that meant, we too carry our crosses Amen.